I don't hear the boarding music, uh, Zuri. Okay? 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 Friday afternoon, folks. Ted Ralston here in our downtown Honolulu studio, actually overlooking Kauai Coffee Company, my remote here. Uh, and our show where the drone leads and today our drone show takes us right to the freshest cup of coffee coffee you could possibly enjoy here in Hawaii out of Kauai Coffee Company. Our guest today, a long time uh, uh, participant on Think Tech Hawaii when he was in Honolulu, now on, on, on the uh, island of Kauai, is uh, Fred Cowell, general manager of Kauai Coffee Company. Welcome aboard, Fred. Thank you, Ted. Welcome. Uh, good to have you here, and uh, we just met this week at, at, the, at the Capitol. It's been a very busy week here in, uh, in, in Hawaii regarding uh, drone activities. Uh, hearings in the Capitol, uh, the Aviation Day in the Capitol, Ag Day in the Capitol, and yes, yesterday we had an event down at UH where we had uh, demonstrations and displays and discussions on drone technology for uh, members of the legislature. So anyway, uh, but Fred comes to us uh, with, a, with a really exciting perspective and use case for drones in a very positive way on the island of Kauai in terms of optimizing crop progress in the coffee plantation business. Fred, tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, I've been with uh, Kauai Coffee for about uh, a year and a half. I uh, came from Oceanet Laboratories doing a bunch of infrared research. Um, I knew that through sensor technology we could help our farm operations dramatically. Uh, we've got roughly 3,100 acres and we cover it with manpower and the ability to get up in the air, see things that we can't see from the ground, monitor things that we can't monitor from the ground, just seemed like a perfect fit. So you've been able to uh, get this started and, and begin operations with drones actually today in, in Kauai. Um, well, we began using them for uh, overhead imagery, trying to create ortho mosaics. Uh, using near infrared, we wanted to look at plant health, we wanted to look at uh, irrigation stress. Uh, we even wanted to be able to spot invasive vines from the air. Uh, we found out very quickly that uh, it works well not only for aerial mapping but also for uh, video or even uh, photospheres which are very handy for virtual tourism. So from the perspective of managing the crops and managing the water, managing fertilizer, looking at invasive species and uh, optimizing the, the, uh, the production of the coffee product, uh, you found this just in a, in a very short time making a big difference. We do. Uh, even from the very first photos we took, we were able to see uh, specifically where irrigation lines had failed. We have one of the largest drip irrigated coffee farms in the world, roughly 2,400 miles of drip tape uh, emitting irrigation and fertilization through the drip tape. If one of those lines is cut, uh, eaten by a pig, damaged in some way, we could have hundreds if not thousands of trees that would go short on water and nutrition. And unfortunately, we don't see that uh, water stress or nutritional stress from the ground very well, and we want to be able to spot it before it becomes critical. So that's where uh, overhead imagery, specifically uh, multispectral infrared industry, gives us a whole lot of uh, additional tools. And this is, this is pretty interesting. And, and just a couple of years ago, this technology wouldn't have been available. That is the software that does the processing and does the various photo mosaicing and various uh, uh, multispectral imaging and such. And, and the composition of the expressive layer would not even have been available except for a very high-end system. So what's happening is the good old Moore's Law is favoring us now. Things are coming down in price, up in performance, down in weight. And you, you kind of wonder what's going to happen in the next two years, Fred, as this all moves forward. Well, I, from, from watching this from three years ago, I recognized very quickly there were three things that were working in our favor. We knew that GPS technology was getting us tighter and tighter control of the drones, even down to the millimeter level. We knew that uh, camera technology was improving in leaps and bounds. And we also knew that the software to control both the cameras and the, the uh, aerial devices themselves was getting developed much more rapidly and it's much more usable. For instance, on my drone, the controlling software that I'm using just for the flight control software was a $20 app. Um, some of the image processing software is done by subscription, so it's not something that I have to have in-house. 
And all of this is now becoming commercial off the shelf, no longer experimental. So you can actually turn this into almost a, a, a farm as a system, is almost the orientation you're generating here. In fact, you're seeing patterns that you never saw before or that the farm never saw before. So there's, we don't even know what's going to develop in the next couple of years in terms of how these patterns can turn into positive indicators and, uh, and just thinking differently about the whole agricultural situation. Right. And this Another way to think about it is we are, although there is agricultural land available, not all of it is well suited for growing coffee. Um, people say, well, if you have increased demand, can you increase your uh, acreage by 10, 20, 30 percent? That's next to impossible. I don't have the infrastructure. Land is expensive. Uh, irrigation infrastructure is expensive. But it is possible through some of these technologies to see increases in yield by 10, 20, or 30 percent, or decreases in production costs by 10, 20, or 30 percent. It all adds up to the same number, in my opinion. I would rather do better with the information and the land and the labor force I have than try to expand into greater and greater acreage. So capitalize on what you got available today. Uh, get as much out of that as possible in a, in a balanced way and use the technology to help you get there. So at, at your scale of 3,000 acres, this works out very well. Hey, how many drones have you got in the, in the fleet? Say that one more time, Ted. I'm how sorry. Many, how many drones do you have in your operating fleet of drones? Right now, we've just got a single drone. So uh, when we went out to purchase this drone, we set a specific requirement. Uh, our specific requirement uh, was based on number of acres per day to map. And our goal was to be able to get 100 acres per work day. That would give us the opportunity to do the entire orchard uh, in, in roughly every two months, assuming that I'm filming every other day. Right now, my, my most current imagery that I'm using for farm management, my GIS, is three years old through Google Earth. I've got the ability to now put updated uh, imagery into my GIS uh, wherever I need it most. So you can take your, your existing uh, legacy GIS picture and drop in what you've done today, yesterday, and the day before and continually updating that mosaic with uh, current information. And it all Correct. It, it, or you can layer it over time. So you can look for trends as well as look for patterns. This is, this is exactly a, right. a complete different way of looking at farming, isn't it? From what people have thought of before? It is. It's, uh, let me give you an expression that my father taught me once. He said, farming is easy. It's just a matter of doing the right thing at the right time. And what the drone enables us to do is shorten that information loop so that we can do things at the right time. That's all we're doing. Um, the, the circle of information, the ability to get information back into the decision loop is really what we're trying to shorten. This is a good old-fashioned OODA we all learned There you about. go. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, in, in, at your scale of 3,000 acres and uh, uh, 30 days to uh, process the entire, uh, recycle the entire farm imagery, uh, you're beginning to see a pattern of operation that's going to be useful to you. Uh, if you had to go with greater coverage, you need more drones. If you had a reliability situation on the drones, you need to spare. There's, there's other things that will come out of this experience that will be useful to all of us. That's, that's exactly right. The other thing that we're, we're recognizing, and you alluded to it earlier, there are things that we don't even know that our drones can do yet. Um, we've, been, we've been having some brainstorming sessions. We've got, we've got horrible problems with uh, pigs coming in and, and tearing up our fields. Um, pigs with a thermal sensor are easy to find and direct trappers to take care of them. Otherwise, they're just out there somewhere. And they're smart enough to know that when the drip tape is full, they can bite it and get a drink of water. It's like a, a drinking faucet for them. The other thing that we found very quickly is people are just absolutely interested, not so much in the, the name of the coffee or even where it came from. They want to know what you're doing. So we can now give information about what's going on in our fields near real time so that our customers feel part of what we're doing. They're not just out there in a store somewhere. They're on our farm. You could put virtually real time information dynamic on your website and people could see the very coffee they're going to drink two weeks from now sitting in the, in the, in the process somewhere. Uh, exactly right. That's, that's pretty, that's, this is amazing. And uh, uh, if you think of, again, your scale is 3,000 acres and with one piece of equipment, that's pretty darn effective in terms of being able to get one several thousand dollar drone to do all that work to improve your productivity. If you were to think of scaling up 
to the, some of the, uh, to a much larger farm, or if you could think of scaling down to the two-acre truck farm, how do you see the drone activity fitting in those pictures? Well, there's, there's always the right tool for the right job. Uh, in our case, we were looking at a specific set of requirements, and we sized our purchase based on that. Um, there are licensing required requirements. I went and uh, got my FAA remote pilot license uh, in Honolulu a couple of weeks ago. Certainly worthwhile, highly recommended, in fact, required for anybody that's using it for a commercial operation. Um, so as, as I spend more time in the front office, my orchard team is going to become licensed so that they can fly uh, when we need to. It's, it's also a matter of opportunity. When the, when the sun is right, when the wind is low, when the conditions are ideal, we got to go fly. Uh, multiple drones is perhaps the next step. We could go to a fixed wing drone, which would cover more acreage. Um, and there's even folks that are using helicopters and, and manned fixed wing to do the same type of survey. It, we just don't quite have the flexibility. On small farms, which couldn't afford to buy perhaps a multi-thousand dollar drone, uh, there are folks that offer uh, farm survey services on an hourly basis. Great way to go. And you don't have to buy the equipment, and you get somebody who's experienced with what they do. And then what you would uh, need to think about is, of course, uh, at the, as, a, as the scale comes down to the two-acre type farms, uh, the imagery collected would actually pick up somebody else's farm as well. So there's issues of exclusion of information. You certainly wouldn't want to have your farm being looked at by somebody else's drone. How do you see that all coming together in terms of uh, 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 confidentiality, proprietary information, that sort of thing, in terms of this kind of collection? That, that's a little bit tougher. Fortunately, uh, coffee trees don't carry that many secrets, um, provided your neighbor is doing everything that's uh, completely above board. Um, if I were on a smaller farm and I didn't have a neighbor that was exactly uh, next to me, I would let him know that I'm flying on a specific day, just out of courtesy. Um, just common sense wouldn't necessarily need to prevail. The other thing about a small farm with two acres, rough number of trees on two acres is maybe 1,200 to 1,500. I could walk my entire farm in a couple of hours and get the same information that I could from the drone or similar type of information. I just don't have that many legs. Again, 2,400 miles of coffee trees, that's a lot of walking if I were to try to look at it. So the smaller farms would want to bind together and, and hire a service from some service provider uh, yep. so that they wouldn't have to spend those two or three hours walking their two acres, but the drone would do it in five minutes uh, for that, uh, that small acreage and then just combine right. it and then separate results out of the processor and provide it to you as a, as a service. Right now my uh, survey rate with full ortho mosaic is approximately 15 acres in 15 minutes, so an acre a minute. That's a pretty darn high rate of, uh, of accomplishment, it seems to me. An acre a minute, that's, you, can, you, you can't even, I mean, in a minute, you can't you barely penetrate that acre of walking. So the yep, that's, that, that's a bit tough. So if I were walking, it, it would be, uh, my conversion is roughly 4,800 feet for every uh, acre of uh, tree. So roughly a mile walking for every acre that I'm doing. So you have the speed. The other nice the thing about the new technology is we don't fly it. The new technology allows us to program the data gather, send it on its mission. We're required to be in control, have it in visual range. But it flies its mission and then comes back when it's complete. We'll swap batteries and go do the next one. Let's come back to, the, uh, to how this might extend again into the education domain, into the community awareness, and this sort of thing when we come back from our first break, Fred. Well, it, one of the biggest issues that... Hi, and thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Justine Spiritu, and I host the Hawaii Food and Farmer series with my co-host Matthew Johnson of Oahu Fresh. Every week we bring on farmers as well as all the other individuals and organizations that help support a thriving sustainable food system. In fact, it's interesting to learn what others are doing so you don't have to be a Hawaii resident or producing food on Hawaii to be featured on the show, like today's guest, Wyatt Bryson of Jewels of the Forest and Microlab Solutions. Aloha. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being on the show. Um, I love uh, seeing what you guys do, and I really support your mission. And uh, it's really nice being back in Hawaii. And uh, thank you again. It's an honor. So you can see guests like Wyatt every Thursday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you.
We're back on live, folks. Second half of our show here, where the drone leads, Ted Ralston in Honolulu. We have Fred Cowell from the general manager of Kauai Coffee Company in Kauai in his uh, office. Uh, Fred, welcome aboard again. Thank you. Okay, and, and by the magic of Skype, which is working now, we're in good shape. Uh, we had some troubles earlier, and that, that's another issue that comes up. You know, we have uh, the, the, the complex electronic systems generate interface issues and problems that we have. So your experience will be great because it'll be showing how these complex systems executed in the form of a drone and a ground controller work over a long period of time over different weather conditions. You're almost part of the Pan Pacific Unmanned Air Systems Test Range, Fred, by the work you're doing. And uh, we actually need to tap into your experience and use that to drive some of our tasks here at, uh, at, the, at the test range. But what we were speaking of just before the break was uh, the nature of scaling, the nature of how a single drone is so effective at, at the work you're doing and how that effectiveness would, would be translated to larger and smaller farms. But the other piece we want to talk about translating to is the future of farming and the interest that our kids have growing up and how school educational programs in the schools could learn from what you're doing and help take the next step. So how do we, how do we uh, increase the interest in farming in, in terms of the, not just the, the farming itself, but the increasing production of farms uh, through this new technology? Well, farming is, is by its very nature, becoming more and more technological. Um, much of what we're doing, we believe we can integrate sensors, soil moisture meters, anemometers for wind rates, uh, solar measurement to tell us what's going on with the, the sun uh, on any given day. And all of that requires some infrastructure and talent. And as we begin talking with our uh, school age kids, uh, very difficult for me to get um, kids interested in getting their hands dirty, but boy, I offer them a chance to go fly a drone or work with a computer, then they perk up. So that's cool. So the drone has to appeal in itself just by its very nature, as well as the value it provides. So turning this into uh, student programs, tasks and such that the high schoolers can get involved in, taking that integration you're speaking of, which just adds to the system uh, definition or the system complexity and completeness of, of the farm as a, as a system. Uh, uh, so you're we're kind of in a situation where the information is being generated maybe even faster than the system orientation can accept it. So we do need some high level problem solving thinking at that level of integration as well as the sensor development and such. Uh, this is a, a almost becoming a complex adaptive system problem which all of us love to take on. It's, we could even say that it's a system of systems. I've got an yeah. irrigation system, a fertilizing system, um, a nutrition system, a uh, harvest system, processing system, all of those things come into play. None of them stand completely alone, especially in a company like ours that's vertically integrated. So as we take that system of systems approach, uh, the exchange of information really becomes key. And this is, this is uh, again, something that uh, Without the, oh, here we see some, some graphics of, of what we got here. So uh, talk us through this one. Can you see it, Fred, on the screen? Okay, this is the uh, chart we used this yesterday at the UH. Uh, we're showing here the use of UAS and agriculture and Kauai with your company logo in the middle, showing a couple of uh, 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 distant view graphics, which I think, as you suggested, would be very useful in communicating with customers and with suppliers and such on just what the farm looks like today. But then we show on the lower left the green leaf index, which I think you flew last weekend. And uh, tell us about the Greenleaf Index analysis, Fred, and what the red bands on there mean to you. Um, actually, I shot the Greenleaf Index yesterday at about 9 o'clock. <laughs> okay. And was able to turn it and give it to you by about noon, um, even with processing in the cloud. Uh, what we're looking for uh, in that particular block, we knew we had a, a vine infestation, the Mauna Loa vine that was choking some of our coffee trees. And we were doing some experimentation where we could see the thickness of the vines or the difference in the vegetation based on the vines. Uh, green leaf index is a little bit simplistic for the challenge. It's showing us basically where I've got the greatest amount of leaf mass. Uh, where I've got the red showing through some of the lines that's uh, thinner foliage and where I've got the darker green that's the dark foliage, or excuse me, the uh, heavy vines and leaf foliage. So what we have here, though, is, a, is the beginning of a pattern identification of what's going on in the ground, in the watering system, and maybe even in the atmosphere, and certainly in any invasive uh, challenges that are here. And so mm -hmm. if algorithms could be brought forth that would give you in 
sort of instruction as to what to do with that once we have the history under understood and the ground truth and what, what we're going to do about it. So that, that basic presentation of data and that first level of filtering is a key to what the next step has to be. And That's you know, correct. Uh, one thing, one disadvantage that I've got is there are many coffee farms in the world. I don't know of any that are doing uh, coffee leaf, leaf algorithms. Uh, I've got a lot to learn from the wine industry uh, and other industries in California that are of similar scale. Um, but I'm kind of out here on my own. And my next shot would be to take that same field with uh, a near infrared or some other infrared spectrums and see if we could break something else out and then tie it back to the ground truth of what's going on in the field. And so what that's all about more and more is that the drone is a sky hook holding a sensor and what's critical is the software that does the analysis and does the expression of what the information is to let people make decisions. That's why the logo or the label and the statement in the middle of that chart was, hey, it's all about pixels, but it's, it's more about what you do with the pixels. I mean, a, a picture or even a video is nothing more than a gigantic pile of pixels. And how we filter them, how we take out the, the various reflectance aspects and combine them with other pieces of information to try to get some inferences here, things that our brains can't even do, uh, can be done now uh, modif uh, operating on the, on the pixel package. So I think a lot of our future is in, in getting our kids to think about that. What kind of filtration, what kind of analysis, what kind of uh, combinations are necessary to get the best picture out of that? And uh, anybody involved in dynamics would know that the common filtering domain, which is how the same sort of thing is applied to uh, dynamic streams of information, has so many different filter packages that are available today and they're changing every day. So it's all about taking that information in the pixel pile and doing something with it. And you know, we don't think well, about I that I think much. from now on, I'm going to explain that picture of green leaf, leaf index as a brain scan of my coffee order. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and let's talk about the picture on the right in that chart that we showed a minute ago, and that's the landform analysis, which is incredible. From a plain old camera, we're getting a landform analysis, which, uh, talk us through that, Red, that's the volume estimation piece where we're looking at uh, cuts in the earth here. Correct. One of the uh, piles that's highlighted there, we're trying to estimate the volume of that pile. We have a, an on-farm composting operation here on Kauai Coffee that does almost 5 million pounds a year of waste pulp. Uh, that waste pulp is extremely valuable in our orchard to uh, spread micronutrients, um, microbiology, and increase our organic matter. The ability to estimate the volume down to the cubic yard is a huge help. Now I've got an ability to, to determine how much compost I've got ready or how many acres can be treated based on the size of that smart, size of that pile. Uh, that's done... Uh, through a series of shots measuring ray tracing from various different angles to come up with a uh, composite volume. They say that the uh, elevation bands or the ability to determine the elevation of that pile is to within centimeters. So that pile that circled, we came up with 2,477 cubic yards uh, based on that flight. And so that sort of thing would be extremely useful beyond farming in the construction industry, in the, uh, in the quarrying industry, uh, in any kind of land mass uh, looking, even things like disaster management, disaster operations where you want to predict, uh, uh, like in Oroville, California right now, where, um, uh, where landslides are an issue with the, with the sodden earth. So looking at landforms, determining the forces on the land and this sort of thing, uh, all these things are what we have to ask our kids to think about and how we want to take that pile of pixels and do something with it to generate the kind of insight and information you're getting there. But it, it's, it's gotta, this has got to blow you away, Fred, what you've done here in just a couple of days. I mean, it should blow anybody away. And at, at, the, at, at the commercial price that we're talking about these days, this information is just never, we've never seen this before. It's, it's the speed of change. That's really what it is. Yeah. And Moore's Law will say that this will be available free on the internet in two years, and then and the next wave of uh, sensors and sensor analysis will be coming into the picture. Would, is it possible, do you think, after the short experience you've had here, projecting forward, could you write down what the most desired output would be of this sort of pattern analysis or uh, OODA loop optimization? That would be it. Uh, I'm, <laughs> sorry about that, but I almost believe I'm frightened to, to speculate. Yeah. Um, but I'm absolutely curious. There, there are, and it may, and it's not going to come from me. It's going to come from somebody else looking at the problem from a different angle, 
or who has seen something similar used in another context that says, hey, let's try that. Um, the, there really is no limit. It's just a matter of how creative we're willing to be. Uh, I, I run a for-profit company. I have to maintain budgets and timelines and production lines. Um, yet, if I can leverage technology to help me get to those goals quicker, I certainly want to do it. You know, we've worked before, and we've had on the show here, uh, some of your uh, colleagues from your prior company, Oceanet, and there's some things coming in the way of uh, image extraction or information extraction from video and from stills that would even take the looking at the picture out of the game because the, there's no reason that the filtering systems can't recognize things like those uh, leaf index lines you were looking at. And, and so it takes the human out of the loop. You can still go back and review it, but you get a recommendation by the automatic analysis. And at UH, uh, one of the student programs is even putting that on board. So we don't even drop the whole video signal down to the ground, just do the analysis in flight, on board, in real time, and produce a thumb drive at the end of the day with the answers in it. Uh, that's a search and rescue activity. But uh, uh, the hardest thing we've all got is, is the question I asked you. How do we figure out what the requirements are that we need to write down for the benefits of the future and get people pushing in those directions? And the same applies, and we're dealing with law enforcement. We're dealing with at the federal level and the state level. And uh, the environmental issues, uh, coastal geology, uh, and such. And so. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's going to take some, some experience and some leadership and this drone rotary we're talking about that we're going to do on your property in October to try some of those experiments and, and, and tease up the issues of what the future might, might benefit from. This is a, a pretty exciting time for an old guy like me to be uh, seeing it all happen. Well, it certainly is. I, uh, I began my Air Force career shooting celestial out of the top of a C-130 to find my way across the ocean and not GPS can find me within a quarter of a centimeter. Um, things change. Things change for the better, but it is certainly an exciting time. Uh, the old expression that whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over means that the ability to use drones and other tools to use water more wisely, huge area of interest. That's fantastic. Uh -huh. And certainly uh, in Hawaii, where we are transitioning from plantations in some areas to uh, golf courses, so that's that whole issue of water uses is a big issue. Over and over again, we see that. Anyway, Fred, uh, thanks so much for coming on board. Thanks to the leadership you're, you're generating here. Without this kind of real activity, the, the, the benefits wouldn't be evident. And we, they'd be talking. You're, you're putting them into real terms. And that is such a, a positive uh, leadership step here for the whole state. So thank you very much for that. And we'll get you back on the on the, on the uh, show once a month or something like that. I'm sure you've been making that much progress that so we'll learn so much from you. But thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll see you again at the Capitol, I'm sure, uh, very soon, and certainly at the Drone Rodeo on, uh, on Kauai coming up in October. Well, I hope okay. I'm able to host it for you. We've got a wonderful site. Okay, that's great. We're looking forward to it. So, folks, that's it for our show for today. And Fred Cowell, thanks for coming on, and we'll see you all next week.